Hello everyone, my name is Stefan Prodan. I'm a Flux Core maintainer many years now and very happy to be here with you. Uh, I have some exciting news about the Flux project roadmap included in this presentation. So half of it will be we'll talking about uh, scaling Flux and the different ways of doing that and hopefully the other half will have enough time to go over the roadmap for this year. So let's get started with what's uh, Flux. Every year I'm changing a little bit the definition. Flux is so many things, so this is what, uh, what I'm going to say today. Uh, the idea I'm trying to send here with you know, Flux for foundation layer for continuous delivery platforms is that Flux is not the platform. Uh, it's not an end product. It's not something you go there and you know, use it directly. It's best when you integrate Flux with your own things and you build your own abstractions on top of Flux. Um, from a pure technical perspective, Flux is a Kubernetes extension and extends Kubernetes in many, many ways. It's 13 CRDs. I don't know, maybe we should stop. But I don't, don't like 30, so it will work just one next year. And yeah, six controllers. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to use all of this or the, the minimum, let's say, Flux deployment requires you to understand uh, two CRDs. You have to create two custom resources, let's say a Git repo and a customization, and you can use only from the six controllers, two controllers. But <clears throat> given that almost all of you are using Helm, you'll definitely need a third controller, which is Helm controller, and you should probably be interested when Flux fails. So then you'll need notification controller. And maybe you want to fully automate your pipelines and when you deploy a new Helm chart to your container registry or when you build a new uh, app image, a new container image, maybe you want to fully automate that on your staging clusters. And when you are doing that, you'll need the image automation controller. So that's how you get to the whole of Flux. But Flux was designed to be extensible. So it's not only these controllers, you can add more things to it. For example, now there is called the Tofu controllers. There is a cloud formation controller uh, and so on. So we, we've created an SDK, which is called the uh, GitOps Toolkit. It's all written in Go. Flux is all of Go, Golang. So you can use this SDK to write your own controllers. From a security standpoint of view, we, we decided when we created uh, Flux version two, three years ago, that we are not going to build Flux around the idea of plugins and shell exec to other things. Like if Flux needs to reach out to Git, Flux should have the Git implementation in its own code base. So everything has to be native, written in Go, so Flux is predictable. Uh, it has a small attack surface. When we go through a security, security audits, and Flux has gone through many of those, by just looking at the code and analyzing the code, you know exactly what Flux is doing. So we don't do shell execs to Helm, to Git, to nothing. So everything has to be built in. So how would you extend Flux then, right, if there is no way of like in CI, when you add a new step, you put a binary there. The extension model for Flux is that we provide you an SDK, build on top of Kubernetes controller runtime, and you can build your own controllers which can do other things and extend Flux to you know, um, other types of system, targeting things maybe outside of Kubernetes or build your own things in inside Kubernetes, which Flux is not made for. So we have these API constructs in Flux, which are, split them in like four categories. It's about, of course, it's workload definition, right? 
the main purpose is you want to deploy things that are running in your cluster. So we have an abstraction build on top of Helm, customize, and we also support Kubernetes uh, manifests. I'm saying abstraction, but it's not quite that. It's more about a reflection of things that you do with Helm and customize CLI in a declarative model, but we don't abstract it that much. It's just we make it declarative. So it's up to you to build other things on top of these constructs to make, I don't know, have an app definition. Flux does not tell you what an app is. You, it's up to you. You can make it from all these sorts of bits. Um, another category is uh, desired state acquisition. So we started Flux as a GitOps tool, right? Everybody knows Flux for GitOps, but since we, since the version to design, we decided that Git should be one way of acquiring the desired state, and we've pretty fast added uh, S3 compatibility storage to uh, Flux source controller, so you can use buckets. Azure, Blobs, and other things uh, in Google Cloud, the bucket, Google Cloud, Minio, and so on. Um, and in the last two years, one year and a half, we are more focusing on the OCI artifacts story. That doesn't mean that Git, Git is uh, going away from Flux. Flux is still GitOps. You'll still use Git when you collaborate on how you define your clusters, how you configure your applications, but this is more about where is the state stored where Flux comes in and reconciles those clusters. And for some use cases in, I don't know, restricted environments, um, some organizations say, hey, we only allow S3 as a storage which is audited for us. Whatever it's on the cluster cannot go to github.com. We don't want to you know, run a Git server in our production system. So for those types of restricted environments, having S3 compatible storage there is a, is a great way to do GitOps even if you don't run Git as a dependency of your production system. Um, other things, reconciliation, I know. I'm guessing everybody here understands what reconciliation is. Okay, okay. Yeah, so this comes from, from Kubernetes, not something we, we invented in Flux, right? Everything is a controller, there is a controller loop. So you have a desired state and an actual state. In our case, is what's running the cluster and desired state is what's coming from outside. And typically, you do two operations on this. You need to discover, is there a drift between those? And if is there a drift, how can I correct it? And how Flux does it, Flux relies on um, Kubernetes server-side apply. So we, are, we highly optimize for this, where we, even if you have tens of thousands of workloads definitions, let's say, deployment services, all the things in a single, a repo in a single directory and want to apply that with a Flux customization. If you change only a service and only on a deployment, we are not going to apply all the things all the time, what Helm does or kubectl does and so on. We detect exactly what changes and server-side apply using the dry run functionality tells us, tells Flux, hey, only this thing has drifted and we apply only that part. So that's why Flux can you know, um, manage hundreds of resources, thousands of resources, and be efficient while doing it. And the last part, which is very, very important, it's observability, right? Flux does not have a UI, so it's complicated. How do you know what's happening, right? Um, we mainly rely on events, so Flux emits Kubernetes events for everything it does. Uh, and it also, we also log these things which more, with more details. So if you enable something like Kubernetes audit log, or you capture these events, you can get a really good understanding of what's happening. Every time Flux does something, um, there is a Kubernetes event for it. And we annotate these events. So you know, for example, when something fails, 
from which source it originated. Like if, uh, let's say, a deployment fails, Flux will tell you this deployment failed, but it comes from this Git repository, this branch, this commit. So you can basically trace back its origin and you know where to go to fix it. But we've seen that, you know, building aggregation for Kubernetes events is, is not something that every cloud provider offers by default or it's expensive uh, or you maybe want more to build some kind of logic and react into, uh, to Flux events and do something else. So we have this notification controller where you can route the Flux events to external systems. And we have many integrations there. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in the roadmap. So those are, the, let's say, the four categories that Flux tries to, you know, allows you to build your continuous delivery platform. One of the things that we, we really tried with Flux is not be opinated. That's why Flux is complicated. That's why Flux has so many CRDs, so many controllers, because we want Flux to adapt to organizational structure and not the other way around. We don't want when you adopt GitOps to change your whole mindset. GitOps is a mind, implies a mindset change. It's actually hard to make that step. We, and we want to, you know, um, we want Flux to be as easy as possible when it comes to adapting it to all your dev teams, do you have platform teams, which team has which type of access. So we, we, we try to make Flux fit into, into the organizational structure. We also, our goal now that Flux is GA is for Flux to keep up with the growth velocity of your organization. And let's talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the biggest factors if you are into microservices is, you know, keep adding them. So adding more and more things, more microservices, what it means, it's a, it's a lot of pressure on the continuous delivery pipeline. You have more things to deploy. Maybe they are independent. And that means you are doing uh, microservices correctly, but most people, they aren't. Like most organizations I've seen, they play the microservice game, but in, in fact, they are doing uh, distributed monoliths, <laughs> right? You have 10 microservices, but they all need to be deployed at the same time. And you have to match all those versions, and you have to have a specific order in which you deploy them, right? So anyway, you are way better off to the monolith, but not getting there. Another uh, growth factor is, uh, of course, disaster recovery, high availability. You, even if you have a little, let's say you deploy 10 apps, it's not that much, right? But then you want to deploy those as close as possible to your customers, so you will want to deploy them in all over the globe. You want to have you know, backups, you want to have high availability. So you, you still keep adding, even if apps don't grow, for those apps, you still keep adding to the continuous delivery part. So it builds up. Security constraints as well. Maybe you need dedicated clusters, you need to do hard multi-tenancy. Um, and lastly, business expansion, right? You add new apps to, so your business becomes more, it expands to new, uh, territory, but you'll never close the old apps because that's what's making money. So if it, as long as it makes money, it will stay there forever. So you have to maintain more and more things over time. So um, recently I'm, I'm getting more and more of these type of messages on, on Slack from users. They realize like, okay, we started with a couple of things and all of a sudden we Next year, we are going to, you know, deploy thousands of workloads, hundreds of clusters. How can we do that? Can Flux keep up more? You'll start with Flux as a monorepo, probably. You use the example repo, and uh, that's fine. It works, uh, but not at huge scale. You need to rethink a little bit your setup. And 
when you realize that, you can go into panic. Like, I don't see how I can store in a single repo thousands of apps or hundreds of clusters, right? But Flux can actually do well with a monorepo with thousands of apps and hundreds of clusters. It's more about your cognitive load and can you deal with that? But this is what I'm talking about. Flux can actually do it no matter how you organize things. Okay, so scaling strategies. How you make Flux work when you run at huge scale. I suggest you go through this journey where instead of jumping directly to, oh, I want Flux horizontal scaling, I want to run hundreds of Flux instances and so on, instead of going straight to that, I recommend you look into source optimization, control fine tuning, that's the first thing you should do. Then go vertical scaling and lastly, if nothing works, then you should uh, do sharding. Let's see source optimization. So there are there are some things you can can do to Im majorly improve flux speed. And one of the things that I've I'm kissing it every time, every time. Move away from uh, Helm HTTPS repositories. Uh, store your Helm charts in your container registries. It helps out. It helps a lot flux with uh, memory management because. If you have hundreds of hundreds of Helm charts and hundreds of hundreds of versions of those Helm charts and you store them in an HTTP repo, what that means is for, I don't know, that's how Helm does it. It stores everything in a single file. It's a huge YAML file that Flux needs to load into memory every time it needs to figure out, oh, is there a new version, right? So that operation is quite expensive and you can get rid of that operation. You can basically eliminate all that logic by just, you know, do Helm push your container registry. Um, another thing I, I've see like an issue is that when you have this huge app repo, you have thousands of thousands of commits in there, uh, and you place the you know the YAML definition for Flux in next to your source code. That works, but not if you have hundreds of hundreds of repos like that. Why? Because Git history is quite large. Uh, and in the end, Flux doesn't need all your app code. It just needs those uh, definitions. So you either can create a dedicated repo for, I don't know, a group of apps or something like that and store there only the YAMLs, or you can move those, um, move, publish those definitions to the container registry as well. So don't have Flux cloning and pulling from your app repos is one thing that will help you scale it. Um, Flux has a way on how it can apply things in parallel, has a concurrent flag, but if you store everything in a single, and you apply everything from a single directory to the cluster and use a single flux customization, you don't have much room to improve it, right? You can um, take advantage of, of parallelization and having flux applying things concurrently. So that's another strategy, split up your your things somehow logically, I don't know, a cluster add-ons in a directory, apps, you group them by uh, dev teams or whatever, and you have multiple flux customizations which depends on between them. And that's how you can speed up the, the reconciliation a lot. Another thing about controller fine tuning. So you can, can do two, two things. One is you can use persistent storage for the flux source controller. And what that helps you is when you upgrade Flux or the node where Flux source controller runs, when it needs to start up, source controller creates a cache of all your external sources, right? So if you have thousands of thousands of Helm charts and you delete source controller or you upgrade it, it's a new pod, it needs to download all, all those things again from upstream. But if you use a persistent volume for that, the cache is there, so you will not hit that you know, huge spike on your network. Another thing which I found 
very recently, I think late last year, is that on some clusters, a customized build can be very impactful. The, the slowness of the disk where customized control run can be very impactful for customized build operations. And how, how Flux runs it, it basically gets the artifact from source control, then programmatically it runs something that resembles customized build. A way to speed up this and eliminate the disk latency is to use um, an in-memory volume for the temp directory, and that will basically all the, the build operations will be made in memory. And it's not a big issue because these are cleaned up all the time. So it will not, the memory will not grow. That's also a good, a good thing to do for optimization. Vertical scaling, let's say you did all the optimizations, you're still not happy. Uh, you want to deploy everything in one minute, but it doesn't happen. It takes five, whatever. Uh, you can bump the limits. You can add more CPUs, give it more memory. What's really important here is that you should also increase the concurrency level based on a CPU limit. So what's concurrency is like you tell Flux how many go routines to use and how many Helm charts, uh, Helm releases you can reconcile in parallel. So as you can expect, there is a relationship between how much CPU it has and the concurrency level. You can exhaust the CPU if you set concurrency 100, but you give it like a very tiny v-core um, on the node. The problem here with vertical scaling is it also it will hit the ceiling at some point. And the most important thing you should look for are rate limits. You are trying to speed up flux, but you, and the reconciliation, but on the other hand, you may have the opposite effect. If the Kubernetes API is under pressure and it can't keep up with the amount of operations, it will rate limit Flux, and not only Flux, it will rate limit all the other controllers that are running, and you'll end up with a slower uh, reconciliation that you wanted. So you really need to monitor rate limits. That's very important for vertical scaling. So for Flux version 2.2 that we released in December, we decided we, we had people kept asking us like, how many hand releases can Flux reconcile? How many customizations and so on? We, don't ha we didn't have an answer for it. We still don't have a clear answer. But we decided to create um, a repository. We, we have sponsorship for, from uh, GitHub and CNCF, so we have access to the large runners uh, in GitHub. So we decided to write a benchmark, which is, you know, as a reference, you should run this benchmark on your own infrastructure because there are so many things that can be way, way faster, way, way slower. For example, I've run this on, uh, on an M2 CPU and it's like way faster than what you can see here, right? So it, really depends on, on things. But what I'm trying to show you here is that Flux in the latest version is quite fast. It can do uh, 1K Helm releases in eight minutes and 1K customizations in around four minutes. So this is about you deploy at the same time 1,000 versions of your apps. This is what means here. It's not you have in total 1K Helm releases, like you want to run 1K upgrades at the same time. And you, you may think like, who does that? There is no such, no company out there is that fast, doesn't ship that fast uh, updates, right? It's crazy to do this kind of testing. But it's not that crazy if you think about hey, there is a CV in the base image and I'm having all my microservices are Node.js or whatever technology we are using. And there is a CV in a base image and you are patching that base image, you are rebuilding all your apps and you have to deploy them, right? So Flux has to be as fast as possible. It has to, to do that uh, deployment and you may end up with these numbers. 
right? So can I, I've put the link to the repo here. You can can take a look at it and try it on your own. Okay. What about horizontal scaling? It's you know scale vertically. Maybe you want to upgrade more than one key hand release at the same time, or you want to do some kind of isolation and so on. Controllers in Kubernetes can be they are not horizontal scalable. You can't just increase the number of replicas and all of a sudden things will work like that. Um, custom resources are like entries into a database. So if you want to scale controllers, you have to apply the same methodology as you do with, with databases. And how we, we did it for, for Flux, it's uh, through sharding. So there are many ways on how you can shard um, the, and spread the load in the cluster. I added here to strategies. You may want to spin up a Flux instance per tenant and have it dedicated that also adds the security posture, the whole thing. Um, or maybe you run Flux on a management cluster and then you want to run an instance per group of clusters or maybe for each cluster is up to you. But the idea is that you need to figure out how you want to share the custom resources and then imply, apply a label and assign hand releases, customizations, sources to a particular shard. So you can move um, re uh, so resources from one shard to another. You can do canary releases for Flux and upgrade only one instance and assign some uh, Helm release there and see is the new Helm controller working. So the sharding mechanism can also work as, you know, uh, as a um, rollout of the, of the Flux controllers. Uh, this is one example of how you can do it. What, what I want to highlight here is that sharding for Flux is you run a primary installation of Flux that you can easily do it with Bootstrap, then Flux itself manages its shards. That's, that's the idea behind Flux, and Flux Bootstrap is that Flux does its own upgrades. It's a single command that you run once at cluster creation, then you don't touch the cluster. Flux knows how to manage itself. And when you imply um, sharding, Flux will manage also all its shards, so it will know how to upgrade them, uh, it applies the labels and so on. So this is one, one nice thing about Flux is that you know, we, we've built it in, in that way. If Flux is managing all your apps and knows how to upgrade your apps, Flux should definitely know how to upgrade itself and manage itself. So, um, and here is, is an example on how you can structure things, uh, but this is all, all new. Uh, of course, we, we have users and said, okay, I, do I need to label all these things alone? I have hundreds of hand releases. Now I have to add all these labels on my own and so on. You can use uh, an admission controller. I've seen this use case where you have an admission controller policy that mutates all the Flux objects and you can say, oh, if it goes into that namespace, and you know that that namespace belongs to a tenant, then you can add the label for tenancy. And then you, you move the reconciliation of all that namespace to a particular tenant or to a particular cluster. We don't have a mutation controller in Flux. We we'll probably never do. But there are solutions out there, right? In CNCF, there are so many options that you can, uh, you can use here. OK. So that's sharding. Any any questions for sharding? No. Okay. I'll I'll move to the second part. Let's talk a little bit about the roadmap. So two weeks ago we have uh, published the roadmap for this year. As you may know, um, Flux is going through a. Um, Big change. We are moving from a single vendor project to a multi vendor, multi individuals, uh, which are, you know, uh, managing the project. So it's a big change for us. We 
We didn't manage to publish the, to update the roadmap in January. We are kind of late, so we are going to skip a, a, a minor release. But we are now in a good shape. Uh, we've, I've met at this QCon so many people wanted to help us and so many organizations that they want to contribute to Flux. I have high hopes. Uh, Flux will be in a very good position by the end of the year and will grow even more. Um, what we've set up to do for, uh, for the first two quarters, uh, the next two quarters, first is general availability. We are graduating almost 80% of the Flux APIs to GA. For now, we have Flux GA only for Git repo, customization, and receiver. This year, we are promoting all the Helm constructs to GA, which means we are telling you we are not going to break anything. We, we kind of never did it. We, we, we kept uh, backwards compatibility for, for Helm release since three years ago. But this is us telling, telling you like, we, we run the benchmarks, we refactor, Helm controller is in a very good shape and is now ready to go for GA. A lot of people has pushed us like, should do GA of Helm like two years ago, we weren't ready. Now we feel like we, we, we are in a, in a place where we can put this stamp on. Um, and we are doing the same thing for the image automation uh, resources. So one direction is GA, uh, and another direction is adding features to Flux. And this is a sensitive matter. I, I'm becoming very sensitive about adding new features because any new feature comes with you know, new dependencies, uh, more work, more maintenance work, and so on. So we, we are trying to, we, we have an RFC process in place, and what we are trying to do is encourage people that are, want to add these features to Flux to also help us maintain them on the long run. So an example is we are going to ship uh, Notary integration in the next um, Flux version. We already have Cosign, but I know if you've seen the Binami announcement, I think it was this week, all Binami charts in Docker Hub are now signed with notation, right? So if notation is becoming so popular, Flux should definitely be able to work with it. And uh, big thanks to Microsoft for contributing uh, the Notary integration to Flux. It has been a long journey. They had to refactor bits of source controller uh, to make that happen. Uh, it's a huge pull request that we are you know, getting in shape, but this, I hope, I'm 99% sure <laughs> that it will make it in the, in, the next, uh, in the next release. Another thing that we are doing, um, the people from Ericsson together with the CDF uh, organization, they had a lot of use cases for Flux, they use Flux and they want to inte better integrate it with Tekton. So they are uh, contributing the CD events integration in the in the next release, we are going to allow for Flux to react to CD events. For example, Tekton does something, I don't know, it's an OCI artifact, then it can tell Flux, hey, go and reconcile that by uh, sending a CD event to the Flux notification controller. So we are extending the receiver with, with CD events. And later on, we want to make Flux and translate all the Flux events into CD events. So then Flux can tell Tekton, hey, I've deployed that. Now you run the end to end tests. Then you call me back, and then I'm doing something else. Right? So CD events is, is, is really nice for you know, um, being able to mix together different um, components of your platforms. And we. Um, yeah, I'm very thankful for Ericsson for doing all this work. This is uh, going through RFC processes. is a is a good example if you if you look at CD events how how we are we are shipping this into Flux, where basically you open an RFC, you set up the use case, you explain why this is good, who is doing it, where are we going to implement it, what's the impact on 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 the Flux components. Building a receiver is quite easy. It's, 
is not it's not a it's not a big effort. But translating all the flux events and making them compatible with CD events that will be a big challenge because you can easily translate Helm operations to a CD event because you have an install, you have an upgrade, you have an uninstall, right? But with all the other things that are happening in Flux, we don't have that concept. Flux is reconciling. There is no thing, such thing as install, upgrade. It's, you know, you have this state, you move to this other state. So you need to figure out a way on how we can, you know, map what Flux is doing to what CD events expects. So that's, um, that will be an interesting uh, journey for us this year through RFCs and see how we can achieve that. Uh, other things that we are doing is moving forward with Helm OCI improvements. We are going to have, we are going to allow a Helm release to reference an OCI repository. So we are kind of expanding beyond what Helm, the CLI and Helm SDK can do. You'll be able to pin a Helm chart by its OCI digest. So you, even if, you know, a tag is not someone can push on that tag uh, the same chart, the same version, and you want to protect yourself from that, you'll be able in the next version to pin it to digest. So, so it will be also way easier to debug um, hand releases because then you don't have hand repository, a hand chart is generated in a hand release. You just have like in for customizations, the source, which is an OCI repository and the hand release and another interesting thing that people have asked us uh, for a long time was, hey, I want to deploy on staging only release candidates of my Helm charts. I don't want their the stable releases. The stable releases should only go to production. And Samver does not allow you to do that. If you write a Samver um, range, you can't say only pre-releases, right? So we are we are also adding this facility where you can. We already have this concept in Flux where you can filter um, the the with with regexes. You can filter the versions before we apply the the sample ranges. So you can actually in the future actually can say like, oh, if it's a release candidate has minus RC goes to staging. If it's minus test goes to the testing cluster and so on. It gives you more power on how you can, um, you know, um, do things with, with, with Helm and direct Helm uh, automatically upgrades. Um, so we'll probably push more for this type of construct from this moment on where you will have a Helm release and uh, uh, OCI repository. And yeah, major thanks to Sule for being involved into all of this and yeah, control plane. Okay, final words. Uh, I will, I, I've told you a little bit about this. Um, we really need your help as a community. We should strive to make Flux sustainable. And the way I see and I think all the core maintainers uh, have the same uh, impression as me is that we should be able to allow people that are they want to add new features to Flux, give them ownership of those features. And the problem here is, of course, you can contribute to source controller or to, I don't know, Helm controller. And we will say at some point, hey, do you want to become a maintainer? But you only added, uh, let's say, um, verification to source control, right? And we'll propose to you, hey, can you become a maintainer of source control? And most people will say like, source control has so so much complexity. All the Git protocol is there, OCI repositories, Helm repositories, all that stuff, and my little thing that I have contributed, right? So it's a, it's a lot of responsibility that we with, with putting on people when they when we want them to become maintainers. And we are now trying to move to a new model for this where we want to say, hey, if you have contributed this feature, we can make you a maintainer, but only for that feature. And I'm hoping people will be more inclined to do that. It will be easier because you'll 
help us maintain the thing that you are contributed, you have contributed, you are an expert on that little part because you added all that code to Flux. So hopefully with this new model on how we, we assign responsibility to people, we'll be able to increase the, from, we, we have a large pool of people which are making contributions and a very small number of people which are maintainers. And we are trying to increase the number of maintainers without giving them all the responsibility, right? And give them a little bit of responsibility, hoping that in the future, they'll be more knowledgeable of Flux. And at some point, they'll say, yes, I now understand everything. Um, so yeah, please uh, help us. Come, uh, come and see us, talk to us on Slack, help us with the roadmap. And I'm looking forward to you know, working with all of you uh, on the future of Flux. Thank you very much.